flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I really want to thank all of you, and I mean all of you, for coming this evening. Our state legislature, along with five or six other states, are in the process of studying the land management issues that we uh, all face uh, in our different uh, lesser communities. And one of the things that they're studying is um, a concept called the transfer of federal land. So tonight we have uh, our goal with Ken Ivory from Utah. He's here to explain the history and process that some of the states are, are in the process of. Um, can you hear better now? Yes. Yeah. It's not going to work in that handle. Okay. So anyway, um, I'm just excited that you're all here. I'm going to ask that everybody be respectful. This is um, a program that Ken has traveled all over the United States. Uh, he just got back from Washington, D.C. He uh, does this on his own. I know some people have inquired his pain. Ken does this on his own. Um, he's a very dedicated person and um, has a, a heart of gold. So, um, and I am going to ask, as I said, for a respectful audience, please. This isn't about um, left, right, or anything else. This is just about an opportunity to learn something. I hope that you will all uh, appreciate that and appreciate what he has to do tonight. So, uh, at the end, Ken's going to do a presentation. And um, it's got a little bit of length to it because there's a lot to learn. And then there'll be questions at the end. So thank you. And uh, with that, I'm going to present Utah Representative Ken Ivory. Thank you, Susie. Thank you all for being here. It's, uh, it's, it's an amazing time. It, it really is an amazing time for, for a lot of things. And we'll go through a lot of information. My job is to not bring you a solution or, or, or uh, tell you what to do. I'm going to share some information with you. And based on that, in Utah, we've taken some specific action. Uh, there's more action to take. There's a lot of consideration, a lot of things to look at. Um, and then you'll, you'll decide what you need to do. And I'm going to go home and be with my kids. So. You know, whatever, whatever you decide to do, that uh, that that will be uh, issues that you'll have going forward. But we have the status quo right now, from a lot of accounts, is on a very serious trajectory, economically, environmentally, in terms of how we fund education. Um, but let's let's just get started. I'm honored that you're here, and I'm honored that you would take time to do this. We met with a few people earlier, um, and. Uh, Again, this 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 uh, information all started with a with a very, fairly simple question. I want to start out by showing you some things from your governor a couple months ago at the uh, Western Western Governors Association. This is about a, about a three minute video. For those of us in the Western states, you know, there's a real high degree of frustration when it comes to management of our federal forest lands. In Montana alone, the numbers are astounding. Since 2000, 6.3 million acres of Montana's forests have been affected by the mountain pine beetle. 4.3 million acres of forest and rangelands have been impacted by wildfire. The urgency is so apparent. Our forests should provide multiple use. Managing our forests to complement and accommodate those various uses and benefits, it doesn't just happen. In Montana, I think we've done a relatively good job of doing that. We manage only 5% of the state's forested lands to provide up to 15% of the annual timber volume sold in the state. And we do that while still protecting endangered species such as grizzly bear, bull trout, and lynx. On our federal lands, though, the story I don't think is quite the same. Wildlife habitat is degraded. Watersheds are at extreme risk, endangering key fisheries and clean water. Fire dangers off the charts, threatening local communities and stifling <laughs> recreation. To say nothing of the economies of our rural communities. In Montana, we still have a viable wood products industry with small and large mills dotted across the state. Yet, without 
Significant changes in an available timber supply will see more and more of those mills close. Interestingly enough, about six years ago, a diverse group of Montanans came together to try to figure out how we could address these problems. And after years of hard work, they came up with a plan that actually they could all support. But then they took the plan to Washington, D.C. And it was in Washington, D.C. that that group of folks that had all come together on the ground in Montana learned the hard truth. That Washington, D.C. wasn't really interested in finding solutions to these problems. Congress was too polarized to get anything done. They were told, yes, force management's broken, but no thanks, we don't want to try anything new. Unfortunately, now that they believe that the Forest Service and the overall system is simply incapable of getting anything meaningful done on the ground. We now can't wait for the federal government, though, to figure out a solution. It's up to us as Westerners to really bring answers forward, which brings me back to, I guess, my experience as a member of managing Montana's public lands. I think that that model works well because there's a clarity of purpose, first of all. Second, with five statewide elected officials managing these lands, there's direct accountability for decision-making. A third factor involves attorney's fees. People who sue us have no ability to recover their fees. There's about a 12-minute clip, the introduction that the governor gave at the Western Governors Association. That's available on the Western Governors Association website. You can see the whole clip. We tried to just edit that down to... Uh, to give you give you a sense of what he's what he's looking at, but the same thing's happening in all the western states. The the beetle kill devastation is is through all the western states. The density in the forest is through all the western states. The the raging wildfires, the catastrophic wildfires that are killing millions of animals, devastating their habitat, and then after the fires come through, you've got the rains that wash through uh, the watershed. And we're having watershed issues for decades throughout all the western states. So this is a very tremendous issue, and as he said, the urgency is apparent. And, and we've, we've seen that in Washington, one of the best examples of bipartisanship is they're really not solving problems. And if we're waiting around for people to come to our rescue, we really are the leaders we're waiting for, as, as your governor mentioned, and we're seeing that everywhere we go. This is another reason why the urgency is apparent. So environmentally, we're, we're having serious issues and degradation again throughout the West. Economically, in Montana, 42% of your total state revenue comes from a federal government that is broke. In its own financial statement every year, the Government Accountability Office includes in the financial statement that the financials of the United States are unsustainable. They will not do an unqualified financial statement on the financials of the United States. You know, and, and we could spend time talking about the problem, admiring the problem, but in just the first six weeks of this fiscal year, fiscal 2014, the federal government added to the national debt $1 trillion in just six weeks. And 42% of your state revenue, 45% of my state revenue, comes from a federal government that is fiscally suicidal. Again, bipartisan. They haven't had a budget for five years, and this is, this is both parties in Washington bringing this to us. And no matter what happens in Washington, with that 42% at stake, we have to educate our kids. We've got to take care of sick people and poor people, roads and public safety, no matter what happens in Washington. And this is what, is, what we're going for. I mean, can you just imagine, in, in your companies, that 42% of your revenue comes from one single source that you know is unsustainable, they tell you they're unsustainable. They act unsustainably and recklessly at, at every occasion before you. And you go to your board and say, hey, i got a great idea. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. What could go wrong with that? Well, this is where we are in our states. And so we can keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Or we can begin to act rather than be acted upon. And these are some of the reasons. We could go into more detail on some of these things. And, and given time, maybe we'll do some of that. But... But here's the, in, in, in a nutshell, right? We're going to cover more of this, but in a nutshell, the federal government, Congress, promised all states at statehood that it would dispose of the public lands. And we'll look at that. And the promises are the same. They promised all states they would dispose of the public lands at statehood, statehood and the promises are the same. It's already been done before. Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, even Florida, they were 90% federally controlled for decades. 
They banded together, and <laughs> you'll, we'll show you some of the documents. They said, you're not disposing of our land. We can't, we can't educate our kids. We can't control our economy. We can't access our resources to grow our economy. And they banded together and succeeded. They compelled Congress to honor their, their promise of statehood to dispose of the land. We'll look at that. The only solution big enough. In Utah, for example, we have a $2.6 billion shortfall in per pupil funding for education. $2.6 billion. We would have to more than double income taxes to even hope to come close to closing that gap. We'd have to increase corporate taxes by 1,000%. There's no way you raise taxes and close a $2.6 billion gap. And then, like Montana, you saw, we have a $5 billion fiscal gap in our dependence on federal funds. Our, our legislative fiscal analysts, nonpartisan legislative fiscal analysts, said there's a 101% probability that we're going to see sequestration two and sequestration three. They, they place the probabilities extremely high that we're going to see interest rates go to somewhere around the, the national, the, or not sorry, the national average, the average for the 10 year, the 30 year bond. The 10 year somewhere in the 5.5 range, the 30 year bond somewhere in the 6.8 range. Interest rates just going to average adds a trillion dollars to the operating cost of the United States. That crowds out everything else that we know of funding at the federal level, except for Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest. There's no money left for anything else. These are very serious issues, and there's a host of others that are out there. The only solution big enough to better fund education, as you heard from your governor, better care for the environment, for all of the issues that we may have as Republicans or Democrats or liberals or conservatives, at the state level, we pass budgets. At the state level, we work together and, and solve problems. You know, he was talking about your forest group that got together for six years and worked on plans, brought all the interest groups together, got to the table. They're accessible. You know their phone numbers. You can get to your local representatives. They have to live right here with the decisions that they make rather than be governed by people outside of the state where your representatives are three out of 535. As hard as it may be to work out solutions at a state level, we do work out budgets. We do work out difficult problems. And, and those are some of the things that we need to get to. It's the only solution big enough to better care for our lands, to care for the environment. It's the only solution big enough to grow the economy, provide good paying jobs locally and nationally. It's the only solution big enough to get to some measure of, uh, of energy independence. We'll, we'll go through some of those issues as well. This all started with a simple question. The last night of my legislative session, I had a group of Boy Scouts come up, and they, uh, they asked me, Representative Ivory, what are you working on? I said, well, we're working on this issue of transferring the public lands, of getting the federal government to simply honor the same promise of statehood to us that it kept with all states east of Colorado. And I showed them that map and explained that the red represents the federally controlled lands. Their first question, just Im impulsively, just, just spon spontaneously, why the difference? Why the difference? Have you ever thought of that question? Why the difference? Well, we had, uh, I had an opportunity uh, about three months ago to, uh, to be on a continuing legal education panel. I'm a performing lawyer, you see. That means I don't get paid anymore for what I do because I'm a full-time, part-time legislator. The, the pay is part-time. The work is not. But... Um, so I was asked to be on this continuing legal education panel, and there was a professor from the University of Utah, and, and he was very quick to come out and very repeated to come out to say what we're doing is clearly unconstitutional. I mean, clearly. It's not even close. It's just clearly unconstitutional. So I was really interested to hear what he was going to say. So we're in this continuing legal education panel, and he goes first. And he gets up and he puts up this map. Now this is the annual average precipitation for the lower 48 states. And he says, you see how it's different in the west than in the east? You see that? You see it's different there? You see that, right? Well, therefore, the federal government keeps the land. <laughs> right? That makes sense. Makes perfect sense, right? Are you familiar with the arid clause of the Constitution? If your land is arid, the federal government keeps it? I mean, but that was, now, now what was really kind of amusing, I mean, you kind of laugh, but we're, we're, we're teaching 125 or so lawyers, not one of them laughed. You know, your land is arid, therefore the federal government keeps it. Think about that argument on its face, let alone the fact there's no legal basis or justification for therefore the federal government keeps it. But on its face, look at Oregon and Washington, and Alaska that's not even on this map. 
Oregon's 50% federally controlled. Washington's nearly 40% federally controlled. Alaska's 60% federally controlled. More precipitation than all the other states. So that argument doesn't hold water, so to speak, even on its face. But that was argument number one, okay? Argument number one, your land is arid, therefore the federal government keeps it. Argument number two gets way better, okay? Argument number two, he says, uh, in terms of why the difference. No, it's him right here. So argument number two, he says, I've looked at the enabling acts, the statehood contract. I've looked at the enabling acts of all the western states. And they all say these same six words. Forever disclaim all right and title to the unappropriated public lands. They all say the same thing. It's a dead letter. You gave up your land. That was the ransom you paid to become a state. I rest my case. He didn't say that, but he kind of sat down as if to say, I rest my case. And that was it. So forever disclaim right there. Six words, and there you go. So I got up, and I didn't even deal with the arid situation, because that's, you know, your land is arid. I said, well, professor, let's look at that here for a second. You know, right here, the people inhabiting said territory do agree and declare that they forever disclaim all right and title. Wow. How do you, how do you overcome that? Well, you see, that's Alabama's enabling act. Alabama was 90% federally controlled for decades until they stood up and rallied and said, you've got to keep your promise, we can't educate our kids. Write in their resolutions. It's available on the website, the original documents, you can look at their resolutions. You got to keep your promise. Florida stands up and says, We're the worst off of all the western states because you're not disposing of our land. They were 90% federally controlled for decades. Well, you look at this again. Forever disclaim all right and title. Well, you see, that's uh, Louisiana's enabling act. They were 90% federally controlled for decades until they rallied together with their neighboring states and compelled the federal government to honor their promise of statehood. That same language, forever disclaim money, right? Forever disclaim all right and title inappropriate public lands. Well, that's Nebraska's enabling act, and they're 1% federally controlled. Now, Nebraska's a really interesting story, because if you think of Nebraska here, and you think of Nevada over here, you know, wh which one would you think is a state first? You'd think Nebraska, right? You'd be wrong. Their enabling acts, their statehood contracts, were less than 30 days apart. They're virtually identical on the transfer of public lands, on this issue of disposing of public lands. Virtually identical. Nevada's made a state in 1864. Nebraska's not made a state until 1867. Nebraska goes from about 30% public land down to 1. Nevada goes from 86 to 81 in the same time. Why the difference? The language is the same. Why the difference? But see, you see here, forever disclaim all right and title to the unappropriated public lands until, if you look at the rest of the sentence in your enabling act, in fact, let me go beyond that. This forever disclaim all right and title, you see, that's north and south Dakota. North and south Dakota, right to your east, 3.9%, you know, 5.4%. North Dakota had something more than 50% public land at its statehood. Same time as your statehood. Same exact time. Same language. They go from 50% public land down to less than 4. Why the difference? Now what's crazy about that is this language right here. Forever disclaim all right and title. If you read the whole sentence, if you want to read the rest of it, that's hard work. But if you read the rest of the sentence, it says, Forever disclaim all right and title until... Now, I went to public school, but until tells me that that means you forever disclaim until something happens. And that until means something is, is going to happen. We'll see what's in there. But they forever disclaim all right and title until title thereto shall have been extinguished. Well, what does that mean? We don't use that language today. That's kind of term of art language. It's kind of unique. And to understand what that language means, you go back and you look at 1889. And what did they mean when they said that? What did they mean in Alabama's enabling act when they said that? What did they mean in Louisiana? Because it's the same language, right? I mean, that's how when you're looking at, a, at, a, at an agreement, a solemn compact, the Supreme Court has called it, and we'll talk about that a little bit more and show you that. What does that language really mean? Does it really mean we just gave it up, we didn't want it, it was the ransom for statehood? And you have this arbitrary line down the middle of the nation? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Forever disclaim all right and title until. Now, this is your enabling act. Now, here's what's, what's amazing about that. 
Your Enabling Act is the exact same document as North and South Dakota. They pass one piece of legislation. The way the Enabling Acts work, Congress passes legislation called an Enabling Act. And then they say, okay, state, if you hold a constitutional convention, and if your constitution matches up with what we've said in this Enabling Act, the president will draft a proclamation declaring you a state. It's automatic. If you do what's in this Enabling Act, the president will declare you a state. The same Enabling Act, the same document, at the same time, created four states. North and South Dakota, Montana, and Washington. Not just the same language, it's the same document. Why the difference? The same document. Why the difference? The brokerage guy. Also in your Enabling Act, in your Enabling Act, it says 5% of the proceeds of the sales of public lands, which shall be sold, shall be paid to the state for the support of the common schools. Now, you've got to remember that dispose is this grand category. Extinguished title and dispose is, is, the category, is, is this broader classification of get rid of title. Dispose of title, extinguish title. Within that is sell. That is one subset of disposing. If you sell, 5% of the proceeds go to support the public schools. But you've got to dispose, and we'll look at where that comes from in a moment. But the promises are the same. Why the difference? Does that make any sense? So why did the federal government ever hold title to the land in the first place? Why did they ever hold title to the land? We came to a situation where property, life, liberty, property, are the fundamental essentials of what this nation was founded upon. We, we fought a war against the land baron. The king would come in and say, those are my trees. And he put his seal on them. Those are for my ships. And he would come in and seize land and seize resources. They fought a war against that principle of, of centralized ownership of property. They weren't going back there anytime soon. So why did they ever hold title to it anyway? That question starts in 1763. 1763 in the colonial charters. The king granted the charters to the colonies. And to seven of the colonies, they said, you can have claims to the western lands. Six of them, no claims. Get the picture right? Can you imagine, you know, you're doing a trust agreement, and you say, okay, seven of my kids, if you're from Utah, maybe this works, right? <laughs> seven of my kids, you get claims to something, and six of them, you don't get anything? Well, you know what's happening. I mean, you've seen that kind of meltdown. Seven of, the, seven of the colonies have claims to the western lands, six of them, no claims, right? 19, or 1776, lives, fortune, sacred honor for the support of the Declaration. They declare independence, and off they go. Now they're in the middle of a war with the most powerful, well-equipped, well-funded army in the world. By 1780, they're completely out of money. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the situation? They've declared independence. They're in the middle of a war for independence against the most powerful nation in the world, and they're broke. How do we ever get here, then? They're trying to figure out how to make their way through. How do we, how do we raise money to fight this war? Well, governments that are broke besides printing and creating money out of thin air, that's what we're doing today. Typically, they'll, they'll raise taxes, but this is the original Tea Party crowd. Can you imagine? Saying, we're going to go raise taxes against the original Tea Party crowd. The seven said, we're not going there. The seven states said, we'll sell some of our claims to the Western lands. The six, the six said, hey, wait on, wait on. They said to the six, we'll sell our claims. You six, good luck. You go raise taxes. You raise your share of the money, however you're going to do it. The six said, now, wait a minute. We're putting our blood and treasure into this undertaking, and you're going to end up in these big landed states, and we're going to have to tax our people. They're going to flee our state and go to your states. That doesn't work for us. In fact, in their original documents, they called it the Great Embarrassment. It was almost a civil war in the middle of the Revolution. That's how tense this was. They called it the Great Question of the Day. This was a question that occupied all of them in 1780. How do we fund this undertaking? They formed a compact, much like the Colorado River Commission interstate compacts that we have today. They, they came together in the form of a compact, because you see, they didn't have a centralized government at that time that said, hey, we'll just hold the land and we'll do this. They formed an interstate compact and they had an agreement with it. This is their agreement. On October 10th of 1780, this is where the public land question begins. October 10th of 1780, you see the language. Be it resolved that the unappropriated lands, that's still the same language we use today, 
Be it resolved that the unappropriated lands that may be ceded or relinquished to the United States by any particular state shall be disposed of for the common benefit. That means it meant to pay for the war. And there are congresses and congressional public lands committees and, and Supreme Court opinions and the resolutions of states that all, that all affirm this. The, the, the story is consistent. It's the same. And we'll look at some of them as we go forward. The lands shall be disposed of for the common benefit of the United States and be settled and formed into distinct Republican states with the same rights of sovereignty, freedom, and independence as all the other states. And the lands will be granted and settled at such times and under such regulations as agreed upon by Congress. Right? You shall dispose, and they will be granted under such regulations, but for two purposes. Create new states, same rights of sovereignty as all the other states, use the proceeds to pay the debt. Over and over and over again, courts and congresses and presidents and state resolutions reaffirm this history. In fact, in the, in the little handbook we've got back here, there's a veto statement from Andrew Jackson. There are statements in, in a number of Supreme Court cases. We'll look at some of the Congressional Public Lands testimony that reaffirm this history. So they start there, right? Improbably, they win the war. I mean, there's no reason in the world they should have defeated the British. The British, But somehow through this, and this was how the nation was born. Without this, this nation dies in infancy. They called this the great national public trust. Supreme Court cases have also called it a guardianship. You know what a trust agreement is like, right? The trustee owns title. The trustee holds title in his name. The trustee gets the tax notices if it's a property that we have today. But the trustee can't just take the property and go do whatever they want with it. They can't sell the property, go book the cruise. They've got to do what the trust agreement says. They refer to this over and over again, and I'll show you some of the cases in a minute. They refer to this as the trust agreement. They win the war now, okay? So 1784, and they go to Thomas Jefferson and say, we've now won the war, we're now a new nation, you draft the land ordinance. Thomas Jefferson drafts the land ordinance, and he says, in no case shall they interfere with the primary disposal of the soil. Incidentally, that's the other form of language used in enabling acts. You have this forever disclaim language, and you also have don't interfere with the primary disposal. That means don't interfere with what we did in, September, in, in 1780 with this trust agreement. We came together and said, you hold it only to create new states, only to pay the debt, no other use or purpose whatsoever. In fact, after they did that resolution, New York was the first one to cede their land to this compact. And they said that very thing. We're ceding this land to you to create new states, use the proceeds to pay the debt, and no other use or purpose whatsoever. Virginia did the same thing. Two other states did the same thing. Two of the states, North Dakota, or not North Dakota, North Carolina and Georgia didn't cede their land to the United States until 1802, after the Constitution was ratified, which shows you this deal preceded and superseded the Constitution. We'll look at that in just a minute. But here's what Jefferson has to say, right? In no case shall they interfere with the primary disposal of the soil, nor with any ordinances or regulations that Congress may find necessary for securing title in the soil to the bona fide purchasers. That was the purpose of the trust. And they'll be admitted uh, on an equal footing. This is the first time that we can find where this equal footing comes up. It's always in the context of creating new states, having access to the land, disposing of the land, is where this equal footing comes up. 1787, now they're getting ready to make new states. July of 1787, they draft the Northwest Ordinance. This is the enabling act for five of the states northwest of the Ohio River. You got Ohio and Michigan and others up there. This is their enabling act, right? In this document, they say again that the states uh, will be admitted on an equal footing. The legislatures of those states shall never interfere with the primary disposal of the soil, nor with regulations for securing title of the soil in bona fide purchasers. Same idea. Don't interfere with that trust. Then you get to the Constitution. You get to uh, Article 4, Section 3. This is one month away from the Northwest Ordinance. Same guys are going back and forth. Hamilton's going back and forth the whole time between the, the Constitutional Convention and, uh, and the Continental Congress. They're going back and forth. Article 4, Section 3. This So Congress can only act with constitutional authority. right? It can't just make it up. It can't just deem its own powers. It's a, it's a government of limited powers. This is the power with respect to the Western lands. Article 4, Section 3 says, Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make equal rules and regulations. Remember where that came from? We just saw that two or three different times. 
respecting the territory and other property. And then get this last line. Everybody kind of ignores this as if it doesn't have any meaning. In fact, this was the whole reason for Article 4. And nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims. Remember 1763, the claims? 1780, they consolidate their claims in a trust. To, to construe as to prejudice any claims of the United States or of any particular state. You see, the states had a claim that they only hold that land to create states use the proceeds to pay the debt. The United States has a claim on that trust to use that proceed to pay the debt. That's the whole purpose, over and over and over again. Now, how do we know that? Maybe we're just making this up. Well, this is the constitutional debate. There was one page of constitutional debate on this section. This comes from Madison's notes. James Wilson is original member of the Supreme Court, signer of the Declaration of Independence, and signer of the Constitution. He's the only one that fits in that category. He says... Uh, Nothing in the Constitution affects one way or other the claims of the U.S. It's best to assert nothing and leave everything on this litigated subject to the status quo. You see, that was the question of the day. There was so much intrigue and, and litigation and discussion and dispute over how they're going to resolve this question of the, of the public lands to pay for the debt of the war and then resolve their claims together. He says, let's just say nothing about that. We already resolved that in a compact from 1780. Well, James Madison pipes in and he says, you know, he thought it best to be silent on the whole subject, but... He said, but to make it neutral and fair, they had to go farther and declare that the claims of the particular states also should not be affected. Right? They have this compact that they've already got rights in. So Mr. Carroll comes up with this language and says, okay, nothing in this Constitution shall be construed to alter the claims of the United States or the individual states to the Western Territory. That was the idea. The whole point of putting any provision in that Constitution was to say, we've already worked this out. From 1780 forward, we've already worked that out. So in the Constitution, they simply, they, they go into this language, they'll have power to dispose, make equal rules and regulations, don't interfere with any of the claims we've already resolved. That's where the public land question starts. The federal government has title as a trustee for temporary purposes to dispose of the land to create new states, use the proceeds to pay the debt. Any, anything else that would verify that? Well, let's look. By 1830, the debt of the United States is paid off. It's the only time in our history. How would that be? No debt whatsoever. Congress has a bright idea. They said, in their, con in their congressional debate, they said, we have to dispose of the land. That's the great national public trust. It's right in the debate. Henry Clay, you can read a bunch of them. We have to dispose of the land. But since the debt is paid off, we'll just keep the, keep the money in a pot in Congress. And when the states do what we want, we'll give them some money. Does that sound familiar? Right, 42% dependent on federal funds, we're 45% dependent. They pass that bill past the House and it passed the Senate, it runs into Andrew Jackson, he vetoes the bill. In his veto statement, he lays out the history that we've just talked about, and he goes back to 1780, he talks about the deeds of session, he talks about Virginia, he talks about their conditions, he talks about the conditions on this land ever being held for temporary purposes. It's about an eight-page document. It's on the website. It's also in this handbook that we've got back there. But here's just some of what he says in his eight-page veto statement. Highly recommend it to you if you have any interest in knowing the actual history of why there was ever public land in the first place. It's the real interest of each and all the states in the Union, particularly these new states. He's talking about Illinois. And he's talking about Missouri. And he's talking about Arkansas and Florida and Louisiana. That the price of these lands shall be reduced and graduated after they've been offered for sale for a certain number of years, the refuse remaining unsold shall be abandoned to the states and the machinery of our land system entirely withdrawn. What would that look like? It cannot be supposed that the compacts, again, going back to 1780 and the Deeds of Session and the Enabling Acts, it can't be supposed that the compacts intended the United States should forever retain a title to lands within the states which are of no value. And it's no doubt entertained that the general interest, the interest of the whole nation, would be best promoted by surrendering such lands to the states. They did it to Michigan, 13 million acres. They did it to Hawaii, we'll look at in just a second. They, they did all sorts of different land alienations. Some of the Homestead Act, right, if you'll go make the land productive, we'll give it to you. Sometimes we'll give it to you, maybe you pay a little bit of money for it. There were all sorts of land grants. There was all sorts of ways, the regulations that Congress used to dispose of the land. But whether they had to dispose was not in question. Um, this is just one example of, of any number of Congressional Public Land Committee reports. If these lands are withheld from sale, which is the effect of the present system, in Maine may the people of these states expect the advantages of well-settled neighborhoods so essential to the education of our youth. You see, we can't 
educate our kids if you don't keep your promise and dispose of the land. Those states will, for many generations, without some change, be retarded in their endeavors to increase their comfort and wealth because they have not the power incident to all sovereign states of taxing the soil for the benefits they confer. You see, if you can't tax the soil, you're something other than a sovereign state, they're telling us. I don't know what that is, but they're saying you're something other than a sovereign state if you don't have the right to tax the soil. When these states stipulated not to tax the lands of the United States until they were sold, they rested on the implied engagement of Congress to cause them to be sold within a reasonable time. No just equivalent has been given those states for a surrender of an attribute of sovereignty so important to their welfare and an equal standing with the original states. You see, it's consistent, right? Equal standing. You've got to dispose of the land. You've got to do it in a reasonable time. If you look at Article 6, Clause 1 of the Constitution, it says, all engagements entered into before the Constitution are valid and binding after the Constitution. This is the, one of the engagements they're talking about. We already have that in place. We already have this compact in place. This Constitution doesn't interfere or alter that compact that we have to hold the lands in trust for temporary purposes to create states, use the proceeds to pay the debt. This is just another example of one of the resolutions. This is Missouri. There's all sorts of resolutions out there. You can see the, the, the Florida resolution. The Florida resolution says, we're the worst off of all the western states. Think of your geography for a second. We're the worst off of all the western states because you're not disposing of our land. This is, this is Missouri's. The present condition of the western states, mind you. Um, the General Assembly uh, will state that a perseverance in the present system manifestly appears to them to be an infringement of the compact between the United States and this state. Missouri never could have been brought to consent not to tax the lands of the United States whilst unsold and not tax them, uh, the lands sold until five years thereafter if it had been understood by the contracting parties, sovereigns contracting, that a system would be pursued which would prevent nine-tenths of those lands from ever becoming property in the hands of, of, of persons in whose hands they might be taxed. You see, we never agreed that you never dispose, therefore we could never tax. We never would have done that. We never would have ransomed away all of our lands for somehow the privilege of becoming a state. We never would have done that. Same exact thing that we talked about. Nine-tenths controlled by the federal government for decades. So let's look at that for a second. You've got Illinois and Indiana and Missouri and Arkansas and Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Florida, as much as 90% federally controlled for decades. Well, what happened to them? It was one man. It was one man. It, uh, excuse me for just a second. Democratic Senator from Missouri, Thomas Hart Benton. One man took on the charge and made a difference. Otherwise, Illinois is 90% federally controlled today, perhaps. Missouri is 90% federally controlled today, perhaps. He says, my election to the Senate of the United States found me doing battle for an ameliorated system of disposing of the public lands. So I moved against this whole system. I did it in a bill that I renewed annually. But more so, it was in the speeches that had more effect on the public mind than on the federal legislation. You see, knowledge and courage is what made the difference for Illinois and Louisiana and Missouri and Arkansas and Florida. Thomas Hart Benton's courage was so legendary that JFK, in his book Profiles in Courage, some of you may have read that book or have copies of it, Thomas Hart Benton is one of the half a, do half a dozen or so people featured in JFK's book Profiles in Courage. He says, uh, <laughs> it's always cracking up, the new states of the West, right? who's he talking about, right? Illinois and Indiana and Louisiana. The new states of the West, they were sufferers by this federal land policy because Congress was less heedful of their wants and wishes. Well, yeah, if you've only got three out of 535 that are making decisions over what happens in your land, now the numbers were different back then, but it was the same principle. If you've got three out of 535 and the 532... Most of them have probably never been to your state. If they have, they certainly don't know the conditions on the ground. They don't know what's happening in your forest and your wildlife and your watershed and your recreation and your access and your hunting and your fishing. And they're making decisions based on what they know in New York or New Jersey or who knows where. Same exact situation back then. He says, he says, they were like a stepmother, the federal government, instead of a natural mother. And they were a monopolizer of the vacant lands of the West. 
And this monopoly, like all monopolies, resulted in a hardship. Few or none of our public men raised their voice against this hard policy until I came into the national councils. My own voice was soon raised there against it. It's certain a great amelioration has taken place during my time. This is Congress, but that of the public, the sentiment of Congress, but that of the public generally. You see, knowledge. When the people have knowledge in a republic, things change. That's the nature of the system. If the people don't have knowledge, then we continue to do the same things over and over again and expect different results. The whole point of what we're talking about is to have a fact-based conversation. Let's get the facts on the table. Let's understand what they are. Let's address them. Let's look at them and see where we go from here. Because the status quo going forward is, is, is not going to serve our children and sick people and poor people and roads and public safety. The trajectories are just too, too frightful. The members of Congress, and I would submit that the county commissioners and the state legislators and, and other leaders, they said, from the new states again, right, should fix their eyes steadily upon the period of the speedy extinction of the federal title to all the lands within their respective states. They're less than 5% federally controlled today. You just saw Alabama, Louisiana. Their Enabling Act language is the same as yours, same as Utah's. Illinois and Missouri, they have that language that says don't interfere with the primary disposal that comes right from the Northwest Ordinance. Oregon has the same language in theirs. Why the difference? Now, this isn't just ancient history. 1959, Hawaii. Federal government granted all the land of Hawaii. You see, in 1893... The industrial powers came and took the land from the Native Hawaiians gave it to the federal government. Native Hawaiians weren't pleased. As they started moving towards statehood, the Native Hawaiians, had, they banded together, same thing, knowledge and courage. They mobilized, and when the people have courage in a republic, and when the people have knowledge in a republic, things change. And they mobilized, and at Hawaii statehood, this is their statehood in Abraham, 1959. I'm guessing one or two of you might have been around then. I'm not going to point you out. United States grants to the state of Hawaii, effective upon its admission, the United States titled all the public lands, title which is held by the United States immediately prior to its admission. Michigan, they said 13 million acres here, you just take it. Tennessee, when they were made a state here, take all your lands. They didn't have general land offices and any of that. They just said, here, take all the land. There have been land grants, there have been things like that in, in, in a variety of different times throughout the year, throughout the years. This is our one and only... Uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice from Utah, George Sutherland. He says, man has three great rights, life, liberty, and property. In fact, all of the state constitutions at the time of the founding of our nation, they all said that, life, liberty, property. They put pursuit of happiness. They didn't want to confuse the slave question because that was a dispute that they knew they still had to work out, and we did through a lot of pain and suffering. Life, liberty, property. These rights are so bound together as to be a single right. To give a man his life, but to deny him his liberty takes away all that makes life worth living. To give him his liberty, but take from him the property, which is the fruit and the badge of his liberty, you still leave him a slave. You see, property is the essence of liberty, which makes life have its meaning. The way that works, if I, if I, have, if I control my property, I control my body, my thoughts, my sweat, my actions, if I control that and I can accumulate that and I can keep that, now I have choices. And the more property I can accumulate, the more choices I have. Now, government is a necessary institution, and, and so we give up some of our choices. But in our system, we say, we're just going to give up the least amount of choices possible to have a government that deals with national, international affairs and national affairs and leave things to the most local level possible. And you had a governing partnership between the state and the federal government. It was the way it was set up. In fact, the states were supposed to be a check to the power of the federal government. The Supreme Court just said that again last year. But the more choices I have, I can, I can now choose to bless your life, for example. And I can give you something in order to get from you something that I value more than what I gave you and give you something that you value more than what you gave me. You're wealthier at the end of the day and I'm wealthier at the end of the day. We just created wealth and that's the only way it works. If, if I take from this gentleman over here and give to you, I haven't made him any wealthier. And I've not really made you any wealthier. I haven't added to the system. Right? And if you don't do anything, you just expect that we keep taking from somebody else to give to you, we haven't added wealth. The way you add wealth is property and liberty. Property 
property and then the freedom to choose. Property is so critical. It was so critical to the foundation of what we did in our nation. And so then to think that somehow we would allow or establish this, this system where property is in more than 50% of all land in the western United States is controlled by a centralized government. It's antithetical to the founding principles of our nation. John Kenneth Galbraith, world-renowned economist in the mid-80s, had this to say. He said, speaking of this situation of federal ownership of land, where socialized ownership of land is concerned, only the USSR and China can claim company with the United States of America. It's just the nature of what it is. I mean, and you look at, you look at the, the nature of our founding, property was so critical to what they were establishing. So why the difference? We've talked about a variety of things here. I wonder if I've got the wrong presentation up here. I'm going to show you something else. But some of the things that we talked about, okay? This U.S. Supreme Court called these enabling acts solemn compacts. Well, what is that? I don't know. It's something more than a contract. It's a solemn <coughs> compact between sovereign contracting entities. Bilateral agreements with rights and obligations on both sides to be performed in a timely fashion. At about the time, slightly before our statehood, slightly after yours, the Supreme Court has said that the federal government only holds territorial lands in trust for the states ultimately to be created. The Supreme Court, when Alabama was having some issues, and remember the federal government was controlling their land as much as 90% for decades, once the United States has fully executed these trusts, the municipal sovereignty of the states will be complete throughout their borders, and they'll be on an equal footing, the United States never held any municipal sovereignty, jurisdiction, or right of soil in for the territory, except for temporary purposes, to execute the trust. And they also talk about the Virginia compacts and Georgia, you know. They go back to that same story as to why the public land question ever started. What was the duty? Why is the federal government holding these lands? That's what the understanding was at the time of our statehood. That's the context for that forever disclaim all right and title. That's why when you look at North and South Dakota and Louisiana and Nebraska and Oklahoma and it says forever disclaim, that was a quick claim to the trustee. Because you see, in, in the Louisiana Purchase, you had claims before stated. You had nations that had claims. We don't know what Louisiana, or what, excuse me, what France did before they ceded that land. We don't know what Mexico did before they ceded the Guadalupe Hidalgo lands. We don't know what claims were out there, right? The Oregon session from, from Great Britain. We don't know what claims were out there. And so in order to clean those claims up, there was a quick claim deed. If you think about it, if you're the trustee of a trust for someone, and within the family they transferred title back and forth and to and fro, all kinds of different people, and your job is now to transfer the land as quickly and for as much money as possible, but you've got cloud on the title, it's going to be a much tougher job. It was for the state's own benefit, and there's other Supreme Court cases that, that deal directly with this. There's a case called uh, Christiansen versus King County in 1915. goes right into this, and they, 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 they give footnotes all, uh, to all of the other uh, enabling acts going forward. But it was to our benefit, because once they dispose, we get to begin taxing the land. Remember, you're not a sovereign state, you can't tax the land. If they sell in disposing, 5% of the proceeds come to the state. Remember, to educate our kids. It's to our benefit that they dispose of the land more quickly and for more money. The same as it was with all states east of, east of you. Now, some people said, well, somehow, after statehood, you decided you didn't want it. Nobody wanted these lands. I've heard that before. You've probably heard that. Nobody wanted them. Well, again, there's not a nobody wanted them clause in the Constitution. <laughs> when you're made a state, the lands transfer to the state. That was the obligation going all the way back. If you can sell them, fine, but once these lands are of no value, abandon them to the states. 1930, well, let me, let me back up just a second. So we're made a state in 1896, the last of the lower 48, Arizona and New Mexico are made states in 1912. The states are starting to grumble, if you will. In Utah, in 1915, our legislature passed a resolution that said, get on with it. Look, you need to go back to that liberal policy of disposing of the lands. Going back to these solemn compacts, because less than one-third of our land is taxable, we can't educate our kids. Resolution in 1915 said, come on, get on with it. Still expecting, of course, that the federal government's going to honor the same promise it kept with all the states east. By the 1920s, the states are now starting to mobilize together, saying you've got to get on with keeping this promise. By the late 1920s, President Hoover convened a presidential commission 
on transferring title, disposing of the public lands. That led to congressional hearings in 1932, which were actually chaired by your senator from Montana. I can't remember his name. I promised a couple of you I would find that. I'll, I could pull it up on my computer afterwards. But your senator from Montana chaired the, chaired the committee. Now, in the hearing, if, if you can see this, the title of those hearings, Granting Remaining Unreserved Public Lands to the States. Not if, just how. Now the agencies had a proposal. And they said, we're going to grant you all the land. Six great national public trust. We know we need to grant title. We know we need to dispose of the land. We're going to grant you all the land. We're going to keep all the minerals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in the middle of the Depression, the states all banded together and descended on Washington and said, that doesn't work for us. You need to keep the same promise you kept with all the states east of Colorado and keep the whole promise and transfer surface and subsurface to the states. And in the middle of the Depression, based on that bill that was proposed, they killed that bill. Some people say, oh, the states said. They went to Washington and said they don't want the land. No, they don't want just the surface. And, and the arguments and the, and the reports and things in this congressional hearing are, 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 are pretty fascinating. But again, they go back to the same history. 1780 and the trust and the duty to dispose and they then cite the stuff that happened with Illinois and Missouri and Arkansas and said you kept the promise with them you got to keep the same promise with us same thing consistently all the way back all the way forward now with that melting down Congress had to pass a stopgap the Taylor Grazing Act now some people said well the Taylor Grazing Act that's where the states somehow gave up their land because that's the precursor to the BLM and the states said okay you know Somehow, I mean, heard things like that as well. Taylor Grazing Act in 1934. Look at the very first line of the Taylor Grazing Act. It's in order to promote the highest use of the public lands pending its final disposal. It's the same story. Back and forward. It's the same story all the way through. 1945, there was an effort from states. I mean, again, you've got states in the middle of the Depression, states in the middle of World War II. 1945, there were efforts to say, come on, you've got to keep your promise. And then we get to 1976, and this is where everything changes. In 1976, Congress passes a policy act called the Federal Land Policy Management Act, and they say it's now our policy. So after 200 years, from 1780, 1784, 1787, the Constitution, all the things that happened in the 1820s and 30s and 40s and 50s, all the way up to statehood, the Supreme Court cases, the enabling acts where the promises are the same, the, the, the 1930s and beyond, they say it's now our policy, never mind the Constitution, the compacts, all the rest, it's now our policy to retain these lands in federal ownership. Now with that policy, they said, Normally, you'd be able to tax your land to educate your children, provide for public safety and, and whatnot in your community, but we're going to give you a promise. We're going to give you a deal you can't refuse. We're going to give you a promise to pay you payments in lieu of taxes. Remember, if you're a sovereign state, you know, it's an incident of sovereignty to be able to tax the land, and we know that, and you should be able to tax your land to, to, to govern yourself and your own community, but we're going to pay you to not tax your lands. Payment in lieu of taxes. And it's such a great deal that you're going to get 13 cents instead of the dollar that you could get if you tax the lands. Now, we're also going to say, we don't want you to harvest trees because you know that revenue was going right into schools and that revenue was going into local communities. And, and harvesting the trees thinned out the fire load in the forest. We don't want you doing that anymore. But we're going to pay you secure rural schools money to not harvest trees in your forest. And so you get the fuel build up, but we're going to pay you to not do that. Then they also said, we're going to pay you a, a royalty. We're going to give you 48 cents on the dollar instead of the dollar. See, now North Dakota, here to your east, they got to control 100% of the access to their mineral resources. They get 100% of the royalty. They get to control the permitting, and, and they're putting billions of dollars right into school buildings, billions of dollars into classrooms, billions of dollars into roads. They've got tens of thousands of jobs just waiting for people. They have the lowest unemployment rate in the nation. They've got an economy that's thriving. They actually proposed to do away with their property tax. They elected not to do that, but they can. And they're just to the east of you with the same promises, right? 
but, but for these other states in the West, we're going to give you 48 cents on the dollar of the mineral royalties. Because you like 48 cents more than a dollar, apparently. So that's what happened in 1976. Now, they also promised that you would have multiple use with sustained yield and local planning. It's part of the language of, of FLIPMA, the Federal Land Policy Management Act. I, mean, I, I don't know if I showed this earlier, but um, oh, this was even right. That's the problem. Let me get over in this other version here. Come on now, there we go. Right now, this is happening right now. This was last week in your Billings Gazette. Montana has the most inaccessible federal lands. They're already, the access is already being closed off. Thousands of roads are being closed off all over the West. Utah has a lawsuit. Over 12,000 roads that have just been closed off. And, and, you know, those roads then provide access to the school trust lands that were granted to the state outright. Private lands, recreation access, they're being closed off all over the West. Let me go back down here. So we get to this in 1976. In Utah, we realize that we've got a $5 billion fiscal gap, 45% dependent on federally sourced funds for our revenue. We've got a $2.6 billion education funding gap. That's how far below average we are in per pupil funding. And we realize there's no way we close that fiscal gap through taxation or any other gimmicks or other revenue enhancements or whatever you want to call them. These are serious. Looking at where do we go with the resources and the abilities and what do we have to be able to close fiscal gaps, we knew we had to start looking at, at our public lands and what opportunities are there, how do we go forward. We had a meeting to say, okay, where do we go? We know this discussion's been had many, many times. We know there have been all sorts of things that have been tried and failed. But we know there's no other solution big enough to fund education in our case to close those gaps in our economy, that Erskine Bowles, Clinton White House Chief of Staff said we face the most predictable economic crisis in history. Alan Simpson right there with him. You had uh, David Walker, the head of the Government Accountability Office, same thing, said we're, we're, we're headlong into the most predictable crisis there is. Admiral Mullen, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under President Clinton, said the greatest threat to our national security is the debt, and we're sitting with 40% plus of our total revenue coming from that. We've got to do something Status quo is not an answer. As we met to try to figure out where we go, the head of our school trust lands, Kevin Carter, said, there's a case. At that time, the case was less than two years old. It had only been less than a year that it was actually reported. United States Supreme Court, unanimous case. Now, remember we were talking about Hawaii and their statehood and what happened to statehood. The land was taken away from the Native Hawaiians. Hawaii's made a state. All the land is granted to the state. Well, in 1993, the Native Hawaiians were never happy about how, how all that unfolded. 1993, U.S. Senator Daniel Inouye ran an apology resolution in Congress, right? He runs an apology resolution that in, in substance goes like this. He says, you know, whereas, whereas, now, therefore, we apologize to the Native Hawaiians, and nothing in this resolution will disparage or alter any of the claims that the Native Hawaiians may have against the federal government, right? So this is some 30 years after Hawaii statehood in their solemn compact of statehood, their enabling act. Nothing in this resolution will disparage any claims the Native Hawaiians have against the federal government. A couple of years after that resolution, the state of Hawaii goes to sell some of the lands that were granted to it at statehood. And it's an enabling act. The Native Hawaiians, based on that resolution, sue the state of Hawaii and say, oh no, that resolution, that subsequent unilateral act of Congress, alters your statehood. That gives us a lien right in that land. And they sue the state of Hawaii. The district court dismisses the case out of hand. It goes to the Hawaii Supreme Court. The Hawaii Supreme Court upholds the claim. It goes to the United States Supreme Court on those basic facts. And here's what they say. They say the consequences of a state's admission are instantaneous. It ignores the uniquely sovereign character of that event to even suggest that somehow subsequent acts of Congress can diminish what was already bestowed. And that proposition applies with greater force and effect where virtually all of a state's public lands are at stake. 
Think about what they said. Congress doesn't have the authority to change that solemn compact of statehood, bilateral agreements, rights and obligations on both sides, including the disposal of the public lands. Congress doesn't have the authority to change that, particularly where the public lands are at stake. That's what opened the door for us to take a new look. Based on that, we started moving forward and looking at how can we then move forward to uh, work with our federal governing partner on some manner of an orderly transfer of disposing of the public lands for our benefit and for the, for the benefit of the nation, right? You've got a federal government that it overspent a trillion dollars in the first six weeks of this fiscal year. That is overspent by $17 trillion, and that doesn't include the unfunded obligation with 10,000 baby boomers a day that are retiring, and there's no money there. These are serious issues. We're printing $85 billion a month. No nation has ever succeeded in doing that. We don't even print anymore. We just digitally create the money for the Federal Reserve to buy the bonds. We're creating money at over a trillion dollars a year. These are tremendously serious issues. And if you look at any of the, the again, the Clinton White House Chief of Staff, you've got so many others that have looked through this and said, the fiscal crisis is imminent. You can eat the seed corn only so long. And, and so anyway, in looking at that, we passed House Bill 148. House Bill 148 sets a deadline. The deadline is a deadline that you might have if you're negotiating with a, with a partner. If you don't have a deadline you're working towards, delay becomes a tactic. We set a deadline of December 31st, 2014 for the transfer of the public lands. And then we set up a process that we're still working on to measure twice and cut once. Federal public lands become state public lands. It's right in the language of the bill. Let me say that again. Federal public lands become state public lands. Can I say that one more time? Federal public lands become state public lands. If any lands were sold, for example, uh, commissioner, representative, state has public lands. Can you sell state public lands? You can. It's hard, right? The process is very rigorous. You have to vacate the public use, and you have hearings on that. You have to have the terms of sale, and you have hearings on that. But if there's a need, you can do it. It's like selling a street or selling a park. It's a hard process as it should be, but you can do it. So you don't take that off the table, but if any sales do happen, you honor the Enabling Act. 5% of the proceeds stay with the state. 95% of the proceeds go to the federal government. That creates a big disincentive to sell the land. But federal public lands become state public lands for multiple use right in the bill. Hunting, fishing, grazing, access, recreation mentioned right in the bill. Those rights come over status quo, preserved for multiple use, sustained yield with local planning. National parks, off the table. I'm not even talking about that. Now, given the fact that political management now shuts down our national parks overnight with no warning and puts our families out on the street, and that's an $8 billion industry in Utah, it's very serious. That's a discussion we need to have. But in the bill, national parks are off the table. Congressionally designated wilderness, off the table. We're not even talking about that. National monuments, in our case with the exception of the Escalante Staircase Monument, where President Clinton declared that monument standing in Arizona without talking to anyone from Utah, we want to talk about that. We want to talk about what we do there. We want to talk about what an orderly transfer and a process looks like on that one. Military bases, off the table. Uh, Indian reservations, off the table. We're not even talking about those lands. And then we set up a process. How do we begin to examine the transition? Which is substantial. I mean, right now when you heard your governor talk about the urgency that's apparent, the devastating consequences to watershed and habitat and wildlife and air quality from what's already been built up from federal policies that now allow thousands of trees per an acre standing beetle killed dead that even after the fires go through you can't harvest trees out of them in most cases. There's a liability that's built up that is tremendous. So we're looking at that process of how do we sort through that to work through. We look at the process of economics because many will say, well, we can't afford to manage these lands. We'll look at some of the data on that. The data would suggest otherwise in, in a number of the states that are looking at this issue. Um, but that, that's some of the basics of the bill. Five states have now passed related legislation. We're the only state that has set a deadline, if you will. And again, that's as you have in a negotiation. If you don't have a goal that you're working toward, you know, it's the, hey, we'll get back to you tomorrow. 
You know, we'll talk to you tomorrow. No, we have a goal that we're working toward. There's a lot of work to do on this. Where we're 100 plus years getting into this situation, there's going to be some serious work, measure twice and cut once in the transition to make sure that we preserve those rights status quo so that federal public lands can be managed as state public lands. Now in this, uh, the Federalist Society is an organization of about 40,000 constitutional lawyers, scholars, and professors. They did a full legal analysis of what we've done. I would encourage you on the website to read this. Uh, if you want, you can text the word land to 5885 and we'll get a copy of that sent to you. They did a full legal analysis of what we're doing. And they go right back to the same thing. They go back through the history. They go back through the compacts. They go back through the Supreme Court cases. They take the cases like Kleppe and the other cases that were management cases. Where the federal government is the exclusive manager. Yeah, can you have wild burrows on the land or not have wild burrows on the land? Yeah, while the public lands are in federal control, yeah, that's a federal decision. That has nothing to do with transfer of the land, disposal of the land, the obligation to dispose of the land. There is no case on this point. This is a matter of first impression. We have the Supreme Court saying the solemn compacts, the enabling acts are solemn compacts with rights and obligations enforceable on both sides. We have the Supreme Court saying that Congress cannot interfere with, alter the uniquely sovereign character of our enabling act. Beyond that, the obligation to dispose being judicially enforced, it's a matter of first impression. We've got our, our Attorney General's office looking at, at this. They've already, they're, they're briefing it. We're working on how we go forward on the legal case. The remedy is going to be critical. It's going to be challenging. How do you fashion a remedy after 100 years of all this entanglement? That's something that we're working on very, very carefully. How do you craft the proper remedy as you go forward in a situation like that? The hope is that we work with our members of Congress on an orderly <coughs> transfer that allows the federal government that's already shutting down roads and sending notices out to counties all over the West. We can't afford to maintain these roads. We're shutting them down. It's happening all over the West right now. You know, uh, I've got a, a document we can show here later, but in the fires, their fire funds are depleted. Um, well, we'll look at some of this other stuff as we go down. But uh, another legal uh, analysis just came out earlier this week. Constitutional Lawyers Centrin Legal Group uh, was commissioned. They did another legal analysis that came out just this week. We can provide that to you as well. So why the difference? Why did the federal government ever hold the lands in the first place? Why does it matter? Your governor pointed that out very clearly. The economics pointed out very clearly. We'll go very quickly through this. Um, you know, 42% of your revenue comes from a federal government that has debt on that trajectory. It's not just the debt. The deficit on a gap basis, on a generally accepted accounting principles basis, the deficit, the overspend, the accrued obligations on an annual basis are $5 trillion a year now. When you account for the Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security obligations that no money is going into an account, the accrued obligation is something on the order of $5 trillion a year. And this is how we're purporting to uh, cover that. It's going to be Mrs. Yellen now, but, but this has never succeeded in the history of the world. Hundreds and hundreds of countries have tried to, to devalue, to print, to monetize their way out of situations like this. There are all sorts of examples in history. Not one of them has ever succeeded. That's right. Maybe this time is different. Maybe it's not. Um, this is Congressman Rob Bishop uh, talking about, again, why does it matter? At this map. See where the red is, and then I also want you to look at this particular map. States in red are the states that have the hardest time funding their education system. That is the slow growth, slowest growth in education. I hope you realize there is a similarity between the two particular maps. Because the bottom line is, individuals in the West pay more in state and federal taxes than in the East. There are more kids in the West. We have larger class sizes in the West. Our education system has a harder time to fund itself in the West because this map prohibits us from developing our property taxes, developing our energy royalties, developing high paying jobs with income taxes, so kids are hurt in the West. I'm sorry, this map and this situation means that kids are underfunded. Can I get 50? Two seconds. General is recognized for 30 seconds. Kids in the West, their education is underfunded, their teachers' salaries are depressed, and my retirement is threatened because of this particular situation. Just so you know, when he talks about his retirement, Rob Bishop's a former <coughs> high school history teacher. That's why he talks about his retirement. 
But, but why does it matter? I mean, this is serious. We're, we're in situations now that we, we, we try to tweak around the edges to, to, to fund education. And why does it matter? This is wildfires more than 250 acres. Federally managed lands. Even over in the eastern areas, you see the correlation. You know, we'll just go through some of these. But you see these, I mean, millions of animals. Right? We don't talk about this, but in these fires, millions of animals. And their habitat is being burned up for, for decades. You know, after the fires, we've got floods that rage through because you've got no ground cover. Air quality issues are off the chart. You know that better than anyone. Not only is it those issues, tens of thousands of miles of transmission lines, not just power lines, are at extreme risk because of the tinderbox conditions. And then, of course, now we've got you know, the federal budget gets depleted, and you know, we, we know. I mean, we see the meltdown on a monthly basis. We're going to face the whole <laughs> issue of another continuing resolution in another month of where we go. This just came out last year. The FBI and the Department of Homeland Security sent these out to our state foresters. Criminal activity alert. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in their Inspire magazine, because if you're doing a terrorist magazine, that's what you would call it, of course, right? <laughs> Encourages the use of wildfire as a form of jihad. This is the FBI, this the Department of Homeland Security. I actually heard someone say, oh, I can't remember that American Lands Council. They're so radical, they talk about Al-Qaeda. No, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security is warning our state foresters that they're getting chatter, that they're encouraging the use of wildfire because we've allowed the fuel to build up. These are their maps that they're looking at their targets. This next, uh, this next little short video, Senator Lisa Murkowski, you'll, you'll hear her in talking about some of the things we've talked about so far and talking about Bill and SRS and the things that are happening on these lands. The, the community of Wrangell, where I went to elementary school, is a community where 64% of, of their uh, budget for the school comes from secure rural schools funding. Um, when they don't know where 64% of their budget is going to be coming from on a year-to-year -year basis, it causes a great deal of stress. The PILT program, of course, is permanent, so we're not concerned about the program expiring, but what we are concerned about is the level uh, at which the program is funded. PILT was created in 1976 by Congress because we changed our federal land policy from one that was focused on disposal to one that was focused on retention. These payments are literally payments in lieu of taxes to compensate our local governments for the loss in tax revenue caused by this change in policy. Secure Rural Schools, unlike PILT, was largely a replacement program for the receipt sharing programs, whether it's the Forest Service payments to states and the Bureau of Management uh, that Oregon and California have for their payments. These payments uh, made under these programs were historically from receipts generated by timber sales for roads and school purposes. But I think we, we recognize that they were never intended to be a permanent entitlement program, but more specifically a temporary uh, short-term bridge to allow the communities to transition to the new economic reality that was forced upon them by environmental policies that were designed to, to halt timber harvesting. But if you were a community like Ketchikan, where I was born down in southeast Alaska, Ketchikan, their private taxable lands within the Ketchikan Gateway Borough are 0.3%. 0.3%. So if, if you have no other place to go, if 96.5% of the percent of the land in your borough is held by the federal government, the state has 1.3%, the local government has 0.3%, there is 0.3% that is taxable land. So when you say you've got this federal policy that says you can't harvest within the Tongas because we're just saying you can't harvest in the Tongas, and you have no place to go for your tax base. And we say, well, this is just going to be a temporary program for you until you can transition. The question is, what do you transition to? But I think we all know, I mean, we're, we're having budget conversations this week. It's, it's on everybody's mind. Federal government, um, federal government's broke here. We can't continue to pay counties to not utilize the lands within their boundaries. And as chairman, you have, have appropriately suggested where we need to go with this. So you need to be able to, to access 
the resources that are on your lands. We either need to use, utilize our federal lands to generate the revenue and the jobs for our rural communities, or we should divest the federal government of those lands and let the states or the, or the counties and boroughs manage them. Right. It's the same story, right? Over and over and over again, it's the same story. Now, what was interesting, she said we changed our policy. Well, no, we went back and, you know, the solemn compacts and the Constitution and, and the court opinions and the enabling acts, and, and they called that a policy change. But yes, they changed that <laughs> policy and said, you know, the 13 cents on a dollar and the 48 cents on the dollar and the secure rural schools, we can't continue to afford to pay counties and states for not utilizing their land. And that's not hard to, to deduce from what's going on in Washington. Greatest example of bipartisanship, no budget, fiscal irresponsibility, bipartisan. But on the ground, we still have to educate kids and take care of roads and public safety and sick people and poor people, no matter what happens there. We can't afford to do this. We need to open these up or we need to divest, as she was talking to to Ron Wyden. Well, the week after she made this statement, sequestration went into effect, and there's so much we could talk about on sequestration that's, again, madness on both sides of the aisle. Um, but the ones that are getting hurt by this sequestration, right, Congress doesn't have a budget, they're somehow pathologically incapable of, of, of spending only what they bring in, and so they pass this law that says if we can't have a budget, if we can't agree, we're going to have automatic across-the-board cuts, and that's called sequestration. Sequestration goes into effect. It's taking money out of Title I money right out of schools right now. The promise to you, 13 cents on the dollar, instead of you taxing your land, we're going to give you a payment in lieu of the taxation that would allow you to be the sovereign state because you're not a sovereign state and you can't tax the land. We don't know what you are otherwise. Under sequestration, under the guise of the federal government cutting its expenses, they're taking the revenue. Your 13 cents on the dollar is getting cut as well. Now, your secure rural schools, not only is that getting cut, they're going back in time and saying you have to pay back the money you've already spent. That's happening right now. That's happening right now. The 48 cents on a dollar that's your revenue, under sequestration, they wanted to cut that. Fortunately, the, the attorneys general throughout the West, all of them, again, bipartisan basis, said, no, 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 you can't touch our revenue under the guise of you needing to cut your expense. That's our revenue right out of our, grant, uh, right out, right out of our land. And, uh, but that's happening right now. Um, you know, and this is what political management of public lands looks like. I'll take questions when I'm done, please. This is what public man land management of our lands look like. From, from one night to the next, we already went from having a rich resource industry in, in Utah and, and then developed a tourism industry as the resource industry was shut down. We have an $8 billion tourism industry, and, and literally from one day to the next, families are on the curb, out of work. Communities, some of them that have less than 3% taxable land already, lost their tax base overnight over a political squabble in D.C. And I don't care who's at fault, they're all at fault. Because they haven't had a budget for five years, you can't blame that on one party or the other. They haven't been, you know, they've been overspending a trillion dollars a year, you can't blame that on one party or the other. They're all involved in the budget. But the impact is coming right here as it rolls downhill. This is happening within the last few months. This comes from the, the UK Guardian. China is now compelling South American countries to auction off hundreds of thousands of acres of land and all of the natural resources to satisfy debt obligations to China. Thank heavens they, we don't owe them any money, right? You know, do, do we have some obligation on the land? I don't know. I don't, I, don't want to, I, don't, I don't want to find out. I mean, Well, rather, I'd like to find out. I want to make sure that we've secured those lands that China doesn't have some claim. We know they're gobbling up resources all around the world. They've got bilateral trade deals with every country in the world to take natural resources right now. You don't think they don't know that we have natural resources here and we owe them $1.3 trillion and you can't make that connection? You know? We need to establish the terms of that trust so we do protect access to those lands and something like that doesn't happen. Anyone that has access to members of Congress, I would love to have them on the record say, no, absolutely not. There is no obligation, direct, indirect, formal, informal, in any way whatsoever, that China has any claim on our lands or resources. I would love to see that on the record. If any of you have the poll with your members of Congress, please have them ask those questions 
investigate and get that on the record. But we know it's happening in other countries already. We know they're hoarding minerals and resources throughout the world right now. This is the Institute for Energy Research earlier this year. More than $150 trillion in mineral value. This is oil, gas, and coal locked up in the federally controlled lands. Nine times our national debt. This is the Government Accountability Office last year testifying to Congress. More recoverable oil in just Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming than the rest of the world combined. As your governor said, as others have seen, as we can recognize, the status quo going forward, if you project the status quo forward at the trajectory that it's on, it's unsustainable on so many levels. Economically, environmentally, in the education of our children, it's unsustainable. From an energy standpoint, it's unsustainable. The status quo is not working, so it's time to consider, as your governor pointed out in the states, can we be pioneers of the future or are we going to be prison guards of the past? But status quo is not going to work for anyone, and that's not a, not a partisan issue. These are some of the reports that have come out. We'll go through these quickly. But uh, Nevada, has, five states have now passed legislation to begin to study the process, measure twice, cut once. How do we look at an orderly transfer of public lands? How do we assess the transition costs? <laughs> Nevada and, and Utah, Republicans and Democrats supported the bill. Republicans and Democrats co-sponsored the bill, voted for the bill. In Montana, the same thing. In Nevada, the same thing. I can't speak to Idaho. I don't recall. Wyoming, I don't recall what the vote counts were there. The, the, the reporting in Nevada, and this is now being updated and brought current for not only Nevada, but for all the states, but what they had in the data from, from the late 90s, and the projections are that the, the, the disparity is only going to be greater. States already manage millions of acres of public land. You and your state manage millions of acres of public land, as do we in our state. State-managed public lands, on average, yield $6.29 an acre. Federally managed public lands lose $1.86 on average per acre. We can't afford not to, both for the states and for the national government. If this is a solution that helps a lot of issues on a lot of fronts. We can't afford not to. Transition is going to be a huge issue. It's things we have to look very carefully at. Things that, like your governor said, need to bring everyone into the table to look at how you go forward on these things. But, but we can't afford not to when we know that those federal funds are being cut right now. I was just in Oregon last week, you know, on the federal ONC. The, rev, the, the costs far out see, exceed revenues, but the Oregon State revenues that exceed the cost. I didn't go to business school, but I understand that's how it's supposed to work. This is uh, forest management. This came out of the Congressional Natural Resources Committee. State of Washington is only 1,283 times more efficient on revenue per acre than the Forest Service. And it's not the people on the ground. I mean, the people on the ground, good people, care for the land, have a great concern for the land, for the ones that I've met and know, but the policies are tying their hands. And so you sit and watch trees burn, you watch animals burn. I mean, the Coconino Forest, for example, is that you can't touch a tree because of the goshawk. And they tried and tried and worked and worked and tried to get in and thin to reduce the fire risk. Well, the fire came through and it burned all the goshawks, burned their habitat for decades. We're not protecting the animals doing this. You know, uh, water, uh, Montana, you you got to step it up. You're only 178 times more effective at revenue per acre than the Forest Service. We talked about Thomas Hart Benton, knowledge and courage, one man. One man said, nobody was talking about this before he went into the national councils. And he ran the legislation and educated with the legislation year after year after year. But it was the public. In a republic, knowledge and courage of the people in a republic is power. And so he went to the public. And he said, the public mind generally changed. And guess what? Politically, they transferred the land. Anything unconstitutional about that? I mean, whether you think the legal, whatever you think of the legal, there's legal opinions and things that are out there, whatever you think of that, there's clearly nothing unconstitutional about Congress undoing a policy that, as your governor said, is devastating forest, watershed, wildlife, and habitat, and <laughs> quality. There's clearly nothing about mobilizing knowledge and courage in a republic to change a policy to simply honor the same promise to Montana that they kept in the same document to North and South Dakota. There's clearly nothing unconstitutional about that. 
But if it doesn't happen, it's simply because we and our leaders lack the knowledge and the courage. That's it. Well, that means work. So guess what? Nobody's coming to our rescue. If you're waiting for Washington, Republicans and Democrats in Washington, I was just there last week, they'll both tell you it's not working. We're the leaders we've been waiting for. This is, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. I want to just tell you this little story. Um, Thomas Hart Benton, Knowledge and Courage. I'm going to tell you about this. My uh